Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much to Tim and Dan and Rachel for bringing us all together. I think I'm probably speaking on behalf of everyone if I say we really missed this. Um, and thank you for, uh, to the staff of the Institute for taking such good care of us. So uh, I'm going to report on joint work with Carlo Pagano. And uh, the story, I mean, I could start the story in the 19th century, I suppose, but really properly the story starts with a by now famous theorem of Davenport and Heilbronn. Gosh, by the time I've written the title and theorem, I'm almost out of boards, but uh, okay. So uh, the theorem says the following. Uh, we consider the families curly F plus and curly F minus of quadratic fields, real respectively imaginary. And when I say families, really we should order them somehow. So for example, by discriminant. So let me actually say sequences of imaginary respectively real quadratic, sorry, the other way around. Plus is real, minus is imaginary, quadratic fields. And then uh, Davenport and Heilbronn, what they do is they compute the average size of the three torsion in the class groups of these fields. Then as F runs, over, and you have to do these separately, so there'll be one answer for F plus and another answer for F minus. Uh, the average of the size of the class group three torsion is a number. And that number happens to be four thirds in the real case and two in the imaginary case. Um, and the average is to be understood as usual. You, uh, so however, in, how, in whatever way, sensible way you've ordered these fields, you, let's say by discriminant, you let the discriminant run up to X, compute the actual mean among those finitely many fields and then take the limit as X tends to infinity. And uh, a natural question is then, what do these numbers mean? I mean, what, for example, certainly nobody can prove anything if you replace three by five or even by nine, but could you at least, could they, those two people at least predict the result? And the answer I'm pretty sure is no at the time. So I should have said this was 1971. And more than 10 years later, uh, Henri Cohen and Hendrik Lenstra did explain these numbers and did much more in doing so. so uh, they postulated what is now known as the Cohen Lenstra heuristic. I'm very happy somehow that in a conference that has arithmetic statistics in its title, it falls to me on Friday to actually mention these for the first time. They have been floating in the background in several talks this week. But let me now actually spell out what they say. And that came around 1983, 1984. So they say that, let me first do the, <coughs> the imagined quadratic case. Um, and the other thing we'll have to do is work for now prime by prime. So in this case, the prime of interest is three. Fix an odd prime. P, then in the limit as, I have to be careful not to start getting smaller, as F runs over uh, imaginary quadratic fields, so in the usual precise sense as before, the probability that the PC love of the class group 
the, the P-infinity torsion is isomorphic to your given favorite finite abelian P-group is supposed to be inversely proportional to the number of automorphisms of your favorite group. So inversely proportional to one over size of out A. So this is where A is an arbitrary finite abelian P group. And um, so on the one hand, firstly, that exactly predicts, for example, the average of three torsion, if you take P to be a three. Uh, well, actually, maybe first I should say, how do, you, how do you actually make sense of this? So there is some, to, if you wanted an equality here, you would need some constant in front just to ensure that this is an actual probability distribution. The implicit in this is, this is the claim that if you sum these weights over all isomorphism classes of finite abelian p groups, that sum converges. And so you can renormalize to make it equal to one. So uh, the constant won't matter for us. It was actually in, in disguise on the board a couple of times this week. So um, yeah, it's whatever it has to be to turn this into an actual probability distribution. So why is this? I mean, it's a prediction, but why is it an explanation? Well, the thing is that, in general, if you produce an algebraic object at random by producing some specific instance, but you're only interested in the isomorphism class, you should see these kinds of weights. So um, let me just say this is a very natural weight. So I'll give a few examples. If you fix the size of your group that you're trying to produce at random first, say you want it to be of size n, and then you decide to produce the group by writing down a random n by n multiplication table, well, often what you write down won't define a group, so then you throw it away and try again. Uh, there is a saying that you know, philosophers only need pen and paper to work, and mathematicians need pen, paper, and rubbish bin. Uh, so you will use the rubbish bin a lot, but eventually you'll end up with a group and that you keep. It turns out that the probability that it's isomorphic to a given group of size n will be exactly inversely proportional to this. The reason is that, in general, many multiplication tables describe the same group. But if the group has automorphisms, then those are not different multiplication tables. Those are generally the same multiplication table. So if you have twice as many automorphisms, you have a few times fewer opportunities to produce the, the group in question, so e.g. Uh, random multiplication tables. And that was, in fact, uh, the original motivation for this heuristic. But it gets much better. For example, if you say, wait, but this is an abelian group, I could produce an abelian group by taking lots of generators and imposing random relations on them. Miraculously, it turns out that you'll also end up with these weights. So it's a very robust kind of probability distribution. Um, okay, but already uh, you start getting worried because Gauss already tells you, or at least conjectures, and then theorems by many people tell you that uh, real quadratic fields do not behave in the same way. And so after I've been you know, advertising this very natural probability distribution, I immediately have to do something different in the real quadratic case. And Cohen and Lenstra do that in their paper. Here is what they predict. As f runs over f plus, uh, same story, so we fix an odd prime, and then we ask how often does each given abelian p group occur um, so this time over, yeah, okay, I've already got F plus. Um, so the probability that they predict now, sorry, P infinity, is now inversely proportional to the size of out A, so far so good, but then there is a funny correction factor like this. So you also have to divide by the size of the group itself. And people at the back see this. Um, 
And Cronin Lenstra in their paper wrote, no, this is much harder to justify. And they try. And they, and they give some sort of explanation in terms of the fundamental unit of the real quadratic field, which really is ultimately responsible for this extra factor. But actually, uh, Hendrik once told me that he never believed in this conjecture. He was always expecting somebody to, very clever, to come along to compute these class groups uh, of discriminants up to gazillion and to find a discrepancy in the third decimal place or whatever. I mean, they knew that the numerical fit was pretty good for the data they had at the time, but he never believed it because it just looked so ugly. What, what is this extra factor? How do you explain it heuristically properly? Okay. Um, Jump forwards by a lot. I mean, nevertheless, I should say, the, these heuristics have been extremely influential and, uh, of course, ultimately motivated the work of Manjul Pagava, for which he got the Fields Medal, and now there is an entire industry on understanding these types of probability distributions. So the next theorem in our story is due to Ila Varma, I think from 2016. Ila was interested in doing what Davenport and Heilbronn did, but not for class groups, but for Ray class groups. So um, and here is what she does. Fix an integer C, and we will consider the Ray class groups with modulus C as the field varies. So then, as f runs, and she did this both for imaginary and for real quadratics, either of these families, uh, the average size of the ray class group now, so this is uh, its three torsion, so this is um, all fractional ideals co-prime to C modulo all the principal ideals that are generated by something that's one mod C um, is, well, huh, okay. So first of all, there are several cases depending on how divisible C is by three or nine or whatever. Ah, um, okay, never mind. There'll be a letter that I'll define in a second three to the m, where m is to be defined, uh, uh, times one plus, then a case distinction depending on which family we are looking at. So, and that's actually similar to before, a third in the case of real quadratic fields and one in the case of imaginary quadratic fields times product p over primes dividing c of one plus p over p plus one, and that's just one of three cases. This is when three doesn't divide C at all. And there is another case if three does divide C but nine doesn't. And there is another case if nine divides C. I mean, it is whatever it is. She just computes these, I say just, she computes these things by managing to parametrize all three torsion classes in all array class groups at once in Bhagava style as lattice points in some symmetric space or orbits thereof and, and count them. Um, okay, I, I promised you to actually define the terms on the board where M is the number of primes dividing C that are one mod three. you think about class field theory, then it's not surprising that uh, these prime divisors are somehow special. And of course, I mean, if Gauss had known class field theory, he would have been just as interested in these ray class groups as he was in class groups. And so since then, uh, Ila and Manjul have been going around and pretty much everywhere they went, they asked everybody, can you explain what these numbers mean?
And so this is now where I finally get to state what our, our goal is for today, for this morning. What do these numbers mean? So um, what we want to do, and I should probably put mean in inverted commas because meaning means something different to every, every person, but uh, Basically, what we want to do is we want to produce a random machine which, where you can press a button and it spits out a group at you, such that when you do it a lot, you get a sequence of groups that is basically indistinguishable from the sequence of uh, ray class groups of quadratic fields. And, uh, but not just that. I mean, that would just be you know, a machine for making predictions. But ideally, we would like a machine that also explains these predictions. So. Uh, just, you know, to, uh, we, we want to not just make a conjecture, we want to make it in style. Uh, so, uh, just to stress how picky I'm going to be, um, so the gold standard is, where is it? Is the cohen lenz heuristic for imaginary quadratic fields here in the corner. And already, if I look at the special case, C being the trivial modulus, where in the real quadratic case, where we have a prediction, Already I'm sort of like a kid that is being forced to eat broccoli. Like I'll eat it if you force me to, but I'd much rather prefer chocolate cake. Okay, now uh, let me remind you, I mean, if you think a little bit about it, so you're trying to, to create a machine that spits out random groups that are a little bit bigger than class groups. Uh, and yet, I want it to be a completely natural model. I don't want you to fiddle with things to make them a bit bigger. Now let me remind you, so I haven't, I, I only defined the ray class group orally. I will actually uh, have more pieces of the definition on the board later. But the really the, the salient feature of it is that, and this is, this, this is true in any number field, if F is any number field, and C is any ideal in the ring of integers, doesn't have to be a rational integer. And of course, we could have also incorporated infinite places, but there things get much trickier. And notice I haven't said anything about two, um, where things also get quite a bit trickier. Then uh, there is an exact sequence. short exact sequence, uh, whose protagonist is our beloved ray class group. And then there is a natural subjection onto the usual class group. And the kernel of this is the following. So um, you take the units in the quotient of O, F, the ring of integers modulus C, and you quotient out the image in this quotient of the global of the actual units of the ring of, of the ring of integers. So modulo OF cross, and I should say, so this is un understood as the image of these inside this quotient, which I'm going to write as like this. OF cross reduced modulo C. Does that make sense? So this is the kernel of the subjection. Uh, maybe this is a good time to pause for a question or two. Okay, cool. Um, so it's the middle term that we want to model, but Cohen and Lenstra already tell us how the right-hand term behaves. And so uh, I think not very long after Hila's paper appeared, um, let me say this. Ephthemios and Kylo proposed a model for these guys in the imaginary quadratic case. Uh, ray class groups of imaginary quadratic fields.
So here is what they say. Well, first of all, if f is imaginary quadratic, these units are basically just plus minus one, apart from finitely many exceptions, which we can ignore because we're taking the limit over many, many fields. Uh, so for, for, for f in this family, curly f minus, um, sorry about this. Uh, the units are just plus minus one, mostly, which is good enough, apart from two exceptions. And so the left-hand term, okay, so the denominator is basically like a constant. The numerator, well, you can partition your family according to the behavior of C in the quadratic field. For example, if C is just a single prime number, then you can s separately look at the fields in which it ramifies, those in which it splits, and those in which it's inert. You know how often each of these things happens. So uh, if you can explain the statistical behavior of rate class groups in each of these families separately, you will have one. So um, partition, this family f minus, we fixed C. C is some modulus that we are trying to understand. According to the behavior of this, recall this, we are taking this to just be an integer, otherwise we'd have trouble asking statistical questions when the field varies. So, so for every candidate ring that O F mod C can be, uh, define F minus R to be those imaginary quadratic fields for which O F mod C is that ring. Yeah, so for example, if, you know, if, if, if C is a prime L, then uh, one possible ring would be F sub L squared, the finite field with L elements, responding to just looking at the fields in which L is in that. Or it could be F L cross F L, et cetera. And then it's enough to predict the behavior of this um, of the ray class groups in each of these f minus sub r separately. I'm going to erase this ahead of time so that it has time to dry. Right, and then, um, so here is the heuristic. I'm just going to write it out. We fix once again an odd prime P. Then uh, two things, well, as F runs over one of these subfamilies. Um, you're trying to model this uh, middle term. Well, let's start with the right-hand term. Cohen Lenstra already tell us what's going on there. And of course, it's natural to suppose that the same thing is going on if you restrict to this subfamily. So, um, 
the class group, the probability that the class group is isomorph, sorry, it's, it's PC love, is isomorphic to your favorite group A, is inversely proportional to the number of photomorphisms of A, and if you condition on what the class group is, well then you've uh, fixed the right-hand term and by restricting to the subfamily, we've also fixed the left-hand term. And so, in, you know, in absence of any reasons not to do so, you just conjecture that this extension is random uniformly in X1 of those two things. Um, so, okay. I'm going to first write it down sloppily and then I'll explain what this really means. Um, uh, among, okay, among F for which the class group is isomorphic to your given, your favorite group A, the PC of. The class of the sequence, which maybe I should have given the name, but I do that now. So the sequence is going to be called S. Um, C. It depends on C. The class of S cool C in X1 of, so it's an extension of A, our class group, by the, the, mm, 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 sorry. I'm only modeling the P part, so maybe of ZP tends it with this sequence. Um, a is already a P group, so that's all right. Uh, in R cross mod plus minus one tends it with ZP. Is a random, it's, it's a random, uniformly random extension. Okay, maybe, uh, so I want to explain how to make this precise, but I'll just say it in words without writing. I mean, the identification between the class group and our given group A is not canonical. So there is some wiggle room here. You could uh, change it by an automorphism of A. And similarly, the identification between O mod C and our candidate ring R, like FL squared or something like that, is also not canonical. You have some wiggle room, you could change it by the automorphism group of the ring. And so that means that you don't really have a way of talking in a well-defined manner about the class of the sequence inside this X1 because, please. Uh, so the question was, isn't the order of R star co-prime to P? So there are two primes going on here. One is the prime the, uh, at which I'm interested in the class group, and the other one is, uh, or potentially several primes, you know, the C, the modulus with respect to which I'm taking the ray class groups. It could be anything. It could be... It's, yeah, that was just an example. So C is not necessarily a prime, just to repeat. Well, it could be a prime that is congruent to one mod, the, pri the P that I'm, say I'm interested in the three, uh, three torsion of the ray class groups, and C could be seven or something like that. Uh, yeah, does that make sense? So C is fixed. Um, I'm, I'm looking at something like the seven ray class groups with modulus seven of varying quadratic fields. Um, yeah, so really I can't talk about the class in this X1, I can only talk about its orbit under the automorphism group of A and the automorphisms of this gadget induced by ring automorphisms of R. 
And so uh, really the, the statement is that the probability that you hit a given such orbit is just the size of the orbit divided by the size of x1. Does that make sense? Or sh should I write something? No shame in saying yes. Okay. Uh, just the p part of this exact sequence, or the, the, the p primary part. So zp turns at the sequence here. Yeah. So I'm, I'm being ultra, I'm being a little bit more careful than I absolutely need to be. I could try to model these ray class groups, just the whole group at once, without breaking it up into p c lobes. But I would run into a couple of difficulties, which I'm just avoiding. And uh, like, so in the case of the vanilla cohen lenstra heuristics, there was a modification for the prime two proposed by Gerth uh, quite a bit later, and uh, recently spectacularly proven by Alexander Smith. So similarly here, uh, Carlo and Ephemius propose a modification of the prime two, which is quite a bit more involved than in the vanilla case. And they prove uh, partial statements towards that, the, the two part of this conjecture. But I probably won't have time to explain wh what the necessary modification is. So the issue is genus theory. At the, at the prime two, these class groups do not really behave randomly. All right. Uh, so that was Munjil's challenge dispatched uh, in the imaginary Krojata case, and now we come to the real Krojata case. And I think uh, some of you can already see what the problem is going to be. So this time, If, if F is a real quadratic field, um, this left-hand term, you can pretty much not make it a constant. Uh, so uh, the CO treated as a constant, OF cross is now isomorphic to plus minus one times a copy of Z. And this copy of Z is generated by some mysterious fundamental unit. That it tends to be very hard to say anything about. And at the risk of looking like an idiot, I sort of like numbers. I'm, I'm going to give you a numerical example with actual quadratic fields. So let's take C to be two, and hopefully this will clarify this question uh, even further. Uh, let's take C, the modulus to be two, so we are looking at ray class groups modulo two. Um, and I mean, I don't, so I will do something similar to what Carl and Ephemius did. Let's just, let's fix the behavior of C in the quadratic field and then see what we can say. So for example, cons let's consider a couple of fields in which C is inert. Um, C is in that in Q joint square root five. So that corresponds to fixing the ring R to be um, uh, the finite field with twenty. Well, sorry, with four elements. And um, so this OF cross is plus minus one times a copy of Z generated multiplicatively by a fundamental unit. Here is one, for example. Three plus square root five, ah, square root five over two. Let me call this chap U1. In this field, the class group itself, of course, is trivial. Maybe this is, I'm going to call this F1. 
The class group of F1 is trivial. So that's the right-hand term of our sequence. And the left-hand term, what do you have to do? Well, you have to reduce this unit modulo 2 and see, so once again, OF mod C is the, is the finite field with four elements. Its multiplicative group is cyclic order 3. And you want to know what shadow does the actual unit group throw into this quotient. So you have to reduce this fundamental, um, this fundamental unit modulo C, modulo 2. Um, U1 is, and really all I want to know, because my, the uh, numerator is cyclic order 3, I just want to know whether the, no the denominator is trivial or, or not, because if it's not trivial, then it's everything. And it turns out that uh, this U1 is not congruent to 1 mod 2, as you can compute in your head. So that means that the left-hand term, the entire left-hand term also vanishes. This computation was supposed to be clarifying, not confusing. So if I've managed to confuse you, please shout. I really shouldn't have done that. Oh, well. Maybe I can make this a problem for the next speaker instead. Ah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> And we can digest this example while I wipe the other board. Hmm. I see what you were saying. But, um, was it Beth? This is actually a good workout. So that was example number one. And now let me take another field in which C is an ad. In F2, which is going to be Q square root 37. Where, once again, Uh, the, the class group itself is trivial. The unit group is now generated by plus minus one, and the fundamental unit I am going to call U2, six plus square root 37. I mean, when I'm writing these things, you can instantly verify that this is a unit, but perhaps not as instantly that this is a fundamental unit. And this guy is congruent to 1 mod 2 mod c, which is 2. Yeah, this minus 1 is in the ideal generated by 2. You can just compute the norm and convince yourself of that. And so that means that, so th this term here is still F4, uh, but the denominator now vanishes. So uh, the ray class group with modulus, modulus C this time is isomorphic to Z mod 3Z. The way this comes about, once again, is it's the multiplicative group of the finite field with four elements. 
the right hand turn vanishes, but the left hand turn doesn't. Yeah, so it could, my, my P that I fixed where the, the prime at which I'm interested in the class group could have been three, for example, and then I would have seen it in the, well, this field would have made a leap in, in the heuristic. So um, somehow, if we, we see from this that if we want to model these ray class groups um, as random objects of some sort, we will have to say something about how this unit C distributes in, in O mod C. Sorry, how the unit, the fundamental unit distributes in O mod C. So here is what we could have done. We could conjecture I'm, getting, I'm now going to give you the broccoli version of a possible heuristic. Uh, so once again, I mean, I, yeah, I'm, I'm going to define uh, f plus r analogously to f minus r. I'm going to uh, partition this family of real quadratic fields according to how c behaves in it. As f runs over f plus r, where this r is, um, yeah, fix the behavior of c, just like in the in the imagined quadratic case. Uh, well, there is no reason for us to suppose that the class group here will behave any differently from the way it does in all real quadratic fields. So the probability that this is isomorphic to a given group is going to be one over the number of automorphisms of A, but then multiplied by the size of A because we are in real quadratic fields and, and Lenstra tell us that that's what's supposed to happen if you average over all R. And well, you know, this fundamental unit, if I don't know anything about it, I'm just going to conjecture that it equidistributes in this quotient, except that I have to now remember that everything is a Galois module. And uh, when we were just interested in the class groups, that didn't matter because the, uh, the non-trivial Galois element always acts as minus one on the odd part. Well, actually on the whole class group. But here, there is some plus part and some minus part, and the fundamental unit had better land in the minus part. So um, the image of the fundamental unit in OF mod C, which remember is a fixed, um, fixed thing, cross and then take the minus part of that minus. So this minus has nothing to do with the plus and minus at the top of F. This is how uh, Galois acts. On this, so uh, yeah, I hope this makes sense. Uh, the image of this is equidistributed. So, you know, if I don't know anything about this unit, then it looks random to me. And uh, among F, for which the class group is something fixed, and the image of the unit is something fixed, um, O F mod C star modulo O F star So for every possible point that the unit could have hit there, I will I just pick out the fields in which it does that. And then my ray class group is an extension and it might as well be a random extension. 
to fit among those F. Um, the class of my sequence uh, once again maybe it tends out with ZP in X1 of uh, A uh, yeah okay tends out with ZP comma Q my given quotient of O mod C cross tends out with ZP is uniformly random. Okay, uh, so I hope this makes sense. Once again, you have to remember that everything is only well defined up to orbits under the actions of various automorphism groups. And also, you should uh, now remember that these are, these are Galois modules, so. ZPC2, where C2 is our Galois group. Okay, a good job of today. Now, I should say, was there a question? Yep. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, thank you. Yeah, that already applies to the imaginary projective case. Yes. Um, so I have no reason to believe that this is false, but it's broccoli, and we want chocolate cake. So we are going to do something different instead. We are going to try and come up with a heuristic that actually explains why it should be true. Huh. Too late. The sequence will come back. Okay, so actually my main aim of the talk is to advertise the definition to you. This is Friday morning, we've had four very uh, filling days of talks. There will be no proofs in this talk, there will be one definition. And if you don't remember anything else at the end, then this is the, the one thing that I want you to take away with you. Um, It's a definition of an object that we call the arakela Ray class group. It's a beautiful object that we haven't seen treated in the literature, so uh, this is just an advertisement for a beautiful mathematical object. So I, I now have to introduce some notation and then actually make the definition. And I can do it for arbitrary number fields. an arbitrary moduli, but I will stick to moduli supported at the finite places. And C, I know that some people some, for some reason hate the symbol for ideal, but I'm now just abbreviating things. So C, an ideal of the ring of integers. Okay, uh, so first of all, um, I have the group ID F of C, that's the group of fractional ideals co-prime to C. So it's just isomorphic to, well, in a canonical way, because we're in a Dedekind domain, to the free abelian group on uh, the prime ideals that don't divide C. Frac P not dividing C. Okay, and then somehow the Arakela philosophy is, it's a very progressive philosophy that you should treat all places equally. And we haven't done that 
in the case of class groups because we've forgotten about the Archimedean places. So we should restore them to their rightful place in the pantheon of places of a number field. And here is how we're going to do that. Consider this etal, real etal algebra F nz over Q with R. So it's a bunch of copies of reals and a bunch of copies of the complex numbers. Um, and it comes with a function that I'm going to call the absolute value of the norm, which is just uh, the, the R algebra norm. It's an R algebra, so it has a norm to R. And if you take its absolute value, so that goes from, and I'm just going to consider it on the invertible elements, cross, why did I introduce the notation if I'm not using it? I will use it. Um, to the positive reals, because I'm taking absolute values. So in plain terms, if you think of this as a product of some R's and some C's, uh, you're just taking the, absolute, uh, the usual absolute values at the real places and the squares of the absolute values at the complex places, and you're taking the product. Uh, let me say a few words about this thing. As I just remarked, this is a bunch of reals and a bunch of complex numbers. So uh, this looks like R cross to uh, some you know, product of so and so many copies, and then C cross and so and so many copies. Now R cross is plus minus one times the positive reals, isomorphic to. And C cross is the circle group uh, cross positive reals. So the maximal compact subgroup max comp of this group is plus minus one a couple of times and circle groups, I'm going to call them S1 a couple of times. I hope this makes sense. And if you quotient this out, you just get a bunch of copies of the positive reals. Okay. Uh, so now I have a, yeah, one more piece of notation. So uh, R, sorry, F bracket C upper one. That's going to be uh, non-zero elements in F cross that are congruent to one mod C. Of course, this already kind of featured in the background in the definition of ray class groups, but let me just remind you of what this means. So, such that for all primes dividing C, all prime ideals dividing C, if you take the valuation of alpha minus one, that's at least as large as the valuation of C at this point. So if a prime divides C to some power, then it should divide alpha minus one to at least that power. Um, and the usual ray class group is id f of C modulo the image of these guys. start on this side. So now I can define, well, okay, so I have a map from FC1 to this group of ideals co-prime to C and to the multiplicative group of this etal R algebra. And so it's the obvious one that takes an alpha and sends it to the ideal generated by alpha and the image of alpha in the tensor product, i.e. under all the Archimedean embeddings. And the product formula says that this, does, uh, this lands not only in this direct product, but in fact in the fiber product over the positive reals, meaning it's 
our algebra norm is equal to the ideal norm. Yeah. So that's just the product formula over all places in the number field. And so finally, the, the, the Eric Kellef Ray class group with modulus C is defined as the quotient. So I'm going to take this, uh, this fiber product and I will also quotient out the maximal compact subgroup here. These bunch of plus minus ones and bunch of circles. So these are my Arakelov divisors, co prime to C, and uh, at the bottom are the principal Arakelov divisors, namely the image of the actual elements under this map. Okay, so this is. Uh, this looks strange. Um, I started a little bit late, didn't I? Five minutes. So I'm going to write a gigantic diagram. Uh, well, it's not gigantic. It's just a three by three commutative diagram that shows what this guy looks like. Uh, so uh, here it is. Here is um, the man himself or the group herself. And if I, so I can, if I just look at the numerator, I could forget that my ideals are co-prime to C. And that will induce a surjective map onto pig zero, but just with trivial modulus, which I will then omit in the notation. And this is called the, the just the Arakel of class group, and that does appear in the literature. And this is a subjective map because if you start with some ideals that are not co-prime to C, you can modify them by a principal ideal to make them co-prime to C. On the other hand, I can also project, uh, I can forget about the Archimedean places and just project here. And uh, as I said earlier, you essentially recover the definition of the usual uh, Ray class group. So I have a map to the Ray class group. And similarly here, then I have a map to the class group. Both of these are subjective. And of course, this is the sequence that we already knew. So we know what the kernel is here. This is this OF mod C cross modulo the image of the global units. And this uh, denominator was kind of cumbersome because it varies in families. But now a miracle happens. And the miracle is that if you fill in, like we used to do when we were little kids and we're filling in these squares with, you know, match the symbols, if you fill in this entry here, it'll be OF mod C cross modulo just the roots of unity coming from the fact that I quotiented out this maximal compact subgroup. And so why is this a miracle? Well, this term now it looks very much like we can easily tr treat it as a constant. If we partition according to how C behaves, then this thing essentially won't vary in families. And to fill this in, so the kernel of this projection when we forget about the, um, uh, the Archimedean places is, is a torus. It's a familiar torus, but now I, I, I don't have time to go into it. And this is a slightly thicker tor torus. And the kernel here is whatever it has to be. Because, well, you can, you can now see what it is. This is, again, the image of these roots of unity modulus C. OK, I'm going to fit my heuristic here. So uh, this bottom sequence, as I said, is this S cool of C. This sequence here, let me call it S ara of C. So that's this middle horizontal sequence. And the conjecture now is that the probability, so you take this middle sequence, um, S, R, of C, 
I want to pick out the P part, but this is not, these are now compact abelian groups, so I shouldn't pencil with ZP. Instead, I will just take the P primary torsion. The probability that this is isomorphic as a Galois module to a given candidate sequence is, drum roll, inversely proportional to the number of automorphisms of the candidate sequence. Where uh, automorphisms of the sequence means automorphisms of all three terms that sort of make everything commute. Thank you. Yes. This is odd S. Thanks. Okay. Uh, in the remaining 30 seconds, I promised you a theorem. And, well, I, I promised you first and foremost a definition, but I do want to state the theorem. So first of all, maybe I won't write it, but the good news is this is not a terribly short-lived conjecture. It is compatible with Varma's result. So you, if you believe, if you draw thing, sequences like this at random and then you compute the average three torsion, you will get this funny formula that we love Varma hand. Um, and also, assume this conjecture, then. Everything is as equidistributed as it's supposed to be. Uh, the class group, well, haha, <laughs> how clever of me. The class group is equidistributed. Um, the fundamental unit is equidistributed in O mod C. And if you condition on those two outcomes, then the extension class is equidistributed in X1. Thank you. I think we can all agree that was a great talk. Um, is there any questions? Ah, yeah. I was kind of afraid you would say that. Okay, so uh, the question is, the usual Arakelov class group can be interpreted it's a, uh, as uh, Hermitian line bundles on, on OF, and what do I have to substitute in for OF uh, to give such a definition of the Arakelov ray class group? And the answer is we don't know. But we would love to know if you can tell us. <laughs> uh, yeah, we thought about it a little bit, and nothing, I, like, we tried a few things, and uh, it always gave the wrong object. Uh, so maybe I should say this is maybe this is a good opportunity to say this. If you're only interested in the sequence at the at your favorite prime p, so like p primary torsion, you could instead have worked with uh, Selma groups in in the right setting. But it turns out that and, and this would have been good enough for quadratic fields, but. Uh, Th this sort of conjecture will, in fact, hold suitably modified for completely arbitrary families of number fields. And there, working locally prime by prime isn't good enough anymore. It'll, you, you'll just get the fa a false result. Um, well, or, or a, a result that is too weak, depending on what you do. Um, so that's why we, we like the Sarah Keller Frey class group rather than just Selma groups. Any more questions? The question is whether we've tried to look at this over function fields. Can I pass this question to Carlo? Carlo has thought about this for a bit, but I'm not sure how far that got. Carlo is working on it. <laughs> Final chance, ask questions. Yep. So um, the question was, what's going on at two? If you just want to understand the class group, so 
the class group modular squares is not random. Let's say understood. And so Gerth says, okay, well, let's just model this guy as random. All the squares in the class group. And he, and, and Alexander Smith proves that Gerth was right, that this really does behave uh, according to the cohen lenstra distribution. So uh, can't we do the same thing here? The trouble is, I mean, so maybe your natural first attempt would be let's take twice the sequence and that will be a random extension of suitable things. The trouble is that not every extension of suitable things, if you take this too naively, arises at, as twice something else. Which is, I mean, any abelian group can be embedded as twice some slightly bigger abelian group, but that's not true of, a Galois, of sequences of Galois modules. Um, so uh, that's why it's so much more subtle. Yeah, I mean, that's essentially the idea, but you have to explain how to actually do that. Yeah, yeah, so that what makes it, so, yeah, sorry, every sequence is twice some other sequence, but uh, you know a bit more about this particular sequence. Um, yeah, not every sequence is twice a sequence with the right properties. Last chance. So the question is, how, how does this recover Ilevarma's counting? Um, okay, do I have two minutes? Can I? Can I? So, um, I'm just going to give a very simple example, which is going to answer half of your question. So suppose that, uh, let, okay, these are compact groups and this T I didn't say but it's basically the units turned into a torus. So the dimension of the torus is R1 plus R2 minus 1. Uh, let's say I, I dualize this because just because I find it easier to think about finitely generated things rather than compact things. And then um, then for example this sequence here or this sequence so when you dualize you have to uh, turn all the arrows around this will be some finite group, and then uh, some um, finitely generated group, and then a copy of Z. And what is, what are the, so this is, yeah, well, uh, yeah, this is finite, and B is some extension. Of course, as groups, it's just the direct sum of these two, but there is a Galois action going on. So what is the automorphism group of this guy? Well, you can, you have automorphisms that just uh, move the torsion around. And then you have automorphisms of Z, which are just plus minus one. But then you have automorphisms that act trivially both on this and on this and still do something interesting. Namely, they take an element here and move it by something here. Um, sorry, the other way around. They take an, uh, an element of infinite order and move it by an element of finite order. So if you, um, if you work it out carefully, and let's say I forget about the Galois action for now, um, then you'll find that the size of the automorphism group of this is two from plus minus one times the number of automorphisms of A uh, from the automorphisms of A, and times these automorphisms that act both trivially on here and on here, and these are just you can parameterize them by Homs from Z to A. It's these moving automorphisms. But what is this? This is just size of A. So if you know, um, yeah, so one thing that is hiding in this uh, probability weight automorphisms of a sequence is, for example, the mysterious, so that's, yeah, so um, the, the, the original cohen heuristics for real quadratic fields are explained that way. But then, uh, but then here there is more. We are looking at this, at this sequence here. 
Uh, so um, that means you have automorphisms that act on this, but preserve this as a subgroup, et cetera, and to, uh, you find that you will, I mean, it, the calculation takes uh, a very non-negligible number of pages to, sh to prove that uh, you have Amos result follows from, from this conjecture, but that's like, it's just an impressionistic picture of how that can happen. Okay, let's give Alex another round of applause.